Hey guys, Filthy Robot here, bringing you the guides, tips, and tricks video. This time we are asking the question of how good is America? So let's dive right in and take a look at these bonuses. First of these is Roosevelt uh, Corollary. Units receive plus five combat strength on, the ho on their home continent, plus one appeal to all cities in a city with a national park, gain the Rough Rider unique unit when they research the rifling tech. Um, yeah, plus five combat strength. This is what I would, at this point now, having I think a fairly good understanding of the combat system, a uh, fairly uh, good number of games under my belt now in terms of multiplayer, starting to see some of the strategies, some of the meta settle down a little bit to get a sense of where this game is going, uh, where the multiplayer is going to end up. I think plus five combat strength is what I would consider a weak bonus right now, a small to weak bonus, I guess is where you're looking at that. Plus 10, you start to see if plus 30 is a one shot, uh, plus 20 being very powerful, plus 10 to be fairly powerful plus five is starting to be not all that great it's a small bonus but it's not a huge bonus um it's okay um the problem with this bonus is not the the quantity of this bonus because plus five is all right and it's available it's a passive bonus that's just being applied to your guys you don't have to plug any social policy cards in for it or anything like that it's just going to be there the problem is really the home continent stuff um continents are outside of your control uh and in, in all likelihood you just you can't you can't pick your city settles based on the continents. You pick your city settles on uh, things like amenities, things uh, like where you spawn, uh, things like river systems and housing. These are the types of things that are going to decide where you settle, not whether or not it happens to be on a continent or not. Maybe on a rare occasion where there's a river and one side of the continent is one continent is on one side of the river and one continent is on the other side. Maybe you'd settle it on the other side just to get that bonus of being applied to units fighting around that city. But even then, it's it, the likelihood of you being able to dictate whether or not this bonus applies is very, very small. The vast majority of the times, it's just going to be lucky if you get it and unlucky if you're in, a, in an area where it's not going to be applied to you. And because of that, I don't value this bonus that highly. Certainly, five combat strength is welcome. Uh, any combat strength modifier, especially one that applies to all my units, is very, very uh, welcome. But this is a... A bonus that only sometimes is going to be good for you and, and it, i've had a, i've had games now with uh, america where i got that bonus uh, consistently across the course of the game and that was very very nice and now i've also had games where i get no bonus at all pretty much the entire time i'm doing all the warring uh, of that game because i'm either fighting a war of aggression in which case i'm in someone else's lands and it just so happened they're on a different continent or perhaps because there just wasn't a lot of war uh throughout the stages of the game um until much later so it's okay, but it's not great. Plus one appeal in all tile, uh, of, to all tiles in a city with a national park. This is a fairly, and this is maybe going to break down a little bit to single player versus multiplayer. It's maybe worth mentioning here. Um, I've managed to win one tourism victory in multiplayer now. Um, I have not yet lost to tourism. Uh, of the victory types that I've played, of all the games I've played up to this point so far, every single game except that one tourism victory has resulted in either a military victory directly or a concede due to superior technology and superior military <coughs> excuse me so in other words there have been no religious victories and only one tourism victory so a bonus that affects appeal which is basically only useful very slightly for housing for neighborhoods and much more uh for tourism as a whole an appeal bonus that is only going to trigger when you have a national park, which is yet another tourism building, or tourism uh, improvement rather, is pretty pretty weak. That's just not a bonus that is very impactful to the game whatsoever. All right, uh, let's talk about the rest of this stuff. Founding Fathers earn the all government legacy bonuses in half the usual time. This is fairly interesting. Um, can I actually get to it here? No, I can't. Uh, yeah, I guess I can if I mouse over here. So what this is, when you when you pick a government, each government has a bonus in there plugged in. You see that 15 plus 15 uh, percent uh, comma plus one percent for every 15 turns on standard speed. Every government except chieftain, which is the, the default starting government, but every government from the, that part of the game onwards has bonuses that are given. That 15 percent, or in the case of autocracy, that 10 percent, or in the case of oligarchy, that 20 percent. That bonus is given to you the instant you pick up that government. So oligarchy here, for example, has 20% uh, combat experience for units, plus an additional 1% for every five turns on standard, for every uh, 15 turns on standard. This one has the extra part of the bonus, and for every 20 turns on standard, this one has that part of the bonus. Um, Teddy's ability is to make that second portion, not the 15 or 20%, but the 1% per X turns. It takes that X, uh, the X and puts it in half. So it's X over two, right? So earn all government legacy bonuses in half the usual time. 
it's an interesting bonus and I'm going to say right now that I don't think uh, enough games have passed to see how impactful these government bonuses are to see some strategies that really, really take advantage of that. Uh, it, you tend to take your government much more on the policies available to it, uh, like the, the card slots available to it, much more than you do the actual bonuses for it. With the exception, perhaps, of Reformed Church, which you're going to be uh, buying faith units. So having the discount on faith units is very important to get that up and running as soon as possible. But mostly, when you get to a new government, you just want to change over to that new government as soon as possible. Now, you do keep that that second part of the bonus, the 1% the per X turns. You keep that 1% per X turns when you change government choices. So if you started with oligarchy and you got, let's say, 5% uh, uh, discount or excuse me a five percent bonus combat experience for all units as the bonus so you had 20 of the base plus you had 25 turns in this government so you got five percent for that uh when you switch government choices you will keep that five percent so teddy will across the course of the game accumulate more legacy bonuses than other civilizations will uh or more of that legacy bonus if you're not changing governments all the time if you're just sticking with one government and moving to one other government you're going to accumulate more of that bonus but i'm not sure how impactful two or three percent is how much of a bonus that really is on most of the stuff you're using so if you look at the types of bonuses available if we go back into uh political philosophy over here um the the bonus here being uh one percent wonder construction Okay, maybe 2 or 3% wonder construction. Probably not, though. Autocracy feels the weakest of the government options available uh, in the early game. Uh, you don't see, see this one run very often. Oligarchy, maybe a couple percent extra experience, which doesn't seem very useful either across the long term. Classical Republic, a couple percent discount on... Um, oh, not discount, but increase in great people points. Maybe that one's a little bit more impactful. Maybe you're going to get a little bit of time for uh, monarchy. So... What is this? Uh, bonus invoice. That's pretty decent. Um, so that one isn't going to be terrible. But even then, by the time you get into Divine Right, you're, there's a limited amount of game left. Uh, Theocracy discount on purchases and Merchant Republic is going to have uh, a discount on gold purchases versus faith purchases. By the time you get into Suffrage, Totalitarian totalitarianism, and Class Struggle, by the time you get into these ones, there's not very much game remaining. Honestly, there's not a lot of time to accumulate legacy bonuses and the previous legacy bonuses don't actually feel that impactful Something like 3% or 5% compared to let's say you get 5% on a non Teddy sieve and even that seems a little bit high Maybe Teddy gets seven or eight ten percent. Maybe like I don't know It doesn't feel it doesn't feel that impactful a lot of the times those bonuses are just going to be wasted or not going to be actually things that you care about at all for that portion of the game so what do I think of this bonus it's Mediocre, maybe mediocre bad. Maybe with a faith purchasing strategy or a gold purchasing strategy, this could be something. Uh, you're gonna get that gold discount a little bit faster and it will give you a little bit more uh, oomph for your gold or faith purchasing needs. But I don't think it's all that good. I think uh, as a whole, you're not gonna notice it very often. Huh. But it's a neat, it's a neat bonus. It's one of these bonuses that I like to, I like to think about it. And I think as we get a little bit more in depth in the game, we might find some strategies that try very hard to take advantage of this. And that might be cool. And I love, I love things that a sieve can do that no other sieve can do. And this is definitely something that this sieve does significantly better than any other sieve, which is accumulate government legacy bonuses, which is kind of interesting. I just don't think it's all that impactful. All right, let's talk about the units. Um, two unique units in a unique building. Uh, we'll start with the Rough Rider. Uh, I've had a chance to use the Rough Rider now. Um, this is a uh, pretty heavy combat strength. So let's, 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 I guess we need to put it in comparison, right? So let's, let's read it first. American unit, uh, American unique modern era unit, which Teddy Roosevelt, uh, when Teddy Roosevelt is their leader, gains culture from kills on their capital's continent. We've already talked about continent bonuses. So this is, this will be a small amount of culture at a portion of the game where your culture yields are pretty big. So it's not massively impactful there, but it's not bad when you get the culture kills, but it is uh, dependent on continent placement, which means you have no control over it. So sometimes it will be okay, and a lot of times it won't happen at all. And plus ton combat strength when fighting on hills. This is another combat bonus, which I don't much like because you cannot control where you're going to be attacking units. What dictates when you're going to be attacking units is basically where that unit happens to be, which is a move that your opponent has made and is often totally dependent on where their cities are. 
it might be on a hill, it might not. It's not like you can go like, I'm going to be attacked. It's not like you can say, I want to use my Rough Rider promotion today. I'm going to attack a guy who only plays on hills. Like that's just not not something you can do. So this is a kind of chance-based bonus. 10, per 10 combat strength. We talked about the size of combat, uh, the size of those bonuses already today in this video. Um, 10 combat strength is a nice bonus. Uh, and certainly having a bonus is good, but it's going to be one of these bonuses that you can't consistently you can predict it because it's going to only going to be in hills, but you can't consistently decide which units you're going to attack based on when you're going to get this bonus or not, which I don't like. I don't like bonuses like that. So it's okay bonus, but not great. Uh, lower maintenance cost, what is it? It's two as opposed to, let's take a look at the other comparisons here. Uh, it's quite a lot lower. Five, two compared to five is quite a big reduction in gold. Um, so that's interesting. I don't know if that will be meaningful or not. Um, the problem with the Rough Rider is a uh, is twofold, um, and it's mostly a problem with the fact it has no prerequisite unit. So, all right, so cavalry in this this era is 62, and this is the unit that you will see the most of in this unit. You will see in this era, you will see uh, cavs and to some degree field cannons, right? These are the units you're going to see most of the fighting done with. I've used rangers now; they're okay, but they're not great. Um, mostly because they're a one one range range unit, which is okay. So you might see a couple rangers to fight with, but most of you are probably going to see cavalry and uh, uh, field cannons. Um, here's the problem with the Rough Rider. It is stronger than them. It's 67 compared to the 62 there. So it's five combat strength stronger. And if you're if you're fighting on your home continent, it will be 10 combat strength uh, stronger because America's plus five bonus. And if you're fighting in a hill, it'll be 20 combat strength stronger, which is really good if that, if that scenario works out. Uh, the problem is you can't pre-build Rough Riders. Nothing upgrades into a Rough Rider. The Rough Rider starts here. It's a heavy cab, but knights don't upgrade into... Um, into Rough Riders. So if you pre-built knights, you can't upgrade them into Rough Riders, which is kind of weird to me. And then uh, the other thing is the Rough Rider doesn't promote into the tank. It's a heavy cab unit. The next heavy cab unit is the tank, which is the next unit that people are going to be fighting for. And if you look at tech-wise, it's right after rifling anyways. Um, people will be going for tanks. You will be fighting tank cords all the time. Um, the problem is this unit uh, upgrades into a uh, modern armor, not a tank. So it isn't you know, you can't get it again until, um, there's modern armor here until the info era. And this is a huge problem because when you're talking, uh, when you, when you want to use a unique unit and the comparison I want to use is the, probably one of the best unique units in the game right now, which is the Cossack. The Cossack is unbelievably powerful, super, super awesome. What you do when you want to Cossack rush someone is you start teching towards cavalry. When you get close, you build a ton of light horsemen or uh, horsemen they're called, right? A ton of the light cab unit before that. And then once you hit the tech, you instantly upgrade all of your units that you have, all of your horsemen, you upgrade them straight into cab, and then you rush somebody or straight into Cossacks or whatever the unique unit you want to use or the special unit when you run, rush someone with. That's that's how you do it. That's a timing push, right? You you invest all your science into getting to a specific military tech. And then you you use all of your, your pre-built, you use your hammers to pre-build the unit and you use your gold to instantly convert units you have uh, into that unit there and you do some serious damage with a timing push. That's, that's how that works. That's what that's the best way to use a unique unit because it gives you the most time to use it and the least amount of time for your opponents to react to it. Can't do that with Rough Riders because you have to hard build these things and these things are expensive. 385 hammers is a lot. If you compare what it costs to build a, you know, a horseman over here, where did the horseman go? Horseman's 80 hammers and then I can gold upgrade it into a into a calf. Now, even a cab is 330 hammers, which is, you know, a lot, but it's not 385. This unit is going to take forever. This was taking my quite decent cities on online speed, something like four to five or five to seven turns to build, depending on the on the city itself, which when you have timing windows, the late game science in this game goes like that. It's so fast because for whatever reason, the science techs don't seem to, the amount of time it takes you to tech the mid, the early to mid game techs is much sh longer than what it takes you to take the tech the late game text. In other words, science is scaling faster than the cost of text scales, which means that as the eras progress, the time it takes to move through an era is smaller, which means the time it takes for a unit to become obsolete is smaller because in the early game, horsemen are going to be around forever and ever and ever because you get them super early and the next strongest unit to fight against, well, it might be knights, but in general, uh, the units are going to be around for quite a while. In the late game, that's not true at all. You go very quickly from cab, very quickly into uh, tanks, very quickly back into helicopters, very quickly into airplanes around here. There's not a lot of time there. So spending 
five turns building a unit that you want to attack with in the time when the science kind of co has compressed the tech tree to make these things even sooner that it's going to be triggering, that's a very long time investment to get a unit that isn't all that great and only inconsistently actually gives you much in the way of bonuses. So a lot of the times I'm just sitting there going, I could build Rough Riders, which aren't going to get any culture because it's going to be on a different continent. And maybe sometimes we'll have plus ton of combat strength in a hill uh, and are a little bit stronger. Or I could build three times as many cavalry by just gold upgrading horsemen. So I don't like this unit. I wanted to like this unit. I have liked it. It is everything I want in a unit in a sense, which is it is a, you know, it's a horse unit and horse units are awesome. It has five move. Oh, Cav have five move too. I was actually just thinking that for a second that was a promotion, but no, it's just five movement at this era in the game. It's a it's a fast horse unit, and the horse units in this game are phenomenal. It's not a melee unit, which means I should love it because I hate melee units in this game. And this is a non melee unit. It's a unique melee, a uh, unique horse unit that's stronger and faster. But it is just too difficult to get them out compared to other unique units. So I'm not very impressed with this unit as a whole. All right. Uh, let's talk about the other units here. We have the P-51 Mustang. It is a uh, airplane replacement. Let's go see if we can find it. I think it's here, right? Yeah. Okay. So it is a 85 melee strength, 65 range strength. It replaces, uh, excuse me, it replaces the fighter. Let's see if we can click on the fighter. Yeah. So 80, 80 melee, 65 range. So it is slightly stronger in melee combat. Um, yeah, it says right there. It gains plus five attack versus fighter aircraft. Has two plus two flight range. It gains 50% experience. Honestly, I have tried to use this unit now, and the tech went so fast in this era that I basically, by the time I could build one of these, I already went from the tech to get it straight into the next round of actual fighters, and I ended up using jet fighters. And I didn't even get to use the, must, uh, the P-51 Mustang because I wanted to use it, but the tech was so quick at this stage in the game. You have so much science in this stage in the game that techs go so, 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 so fast that it just became, it was basically obsolete before I built it, even though I was prioritizing building it. Um, what are these bonuses like? Uh, bonuses versus other fighter craft is a decent bonus. Uh, flight range is a decent bonus. 50% um, experience, uh, decent bonus again. Uh, all those things work in its favor. The biggest problem it has is, well, first of all, any sort of unique unit in the early game is going to be more impactful than a late game unit almost always just because it has more time to play out being useful. It's going to uh, have a bigger snowball factor by influencing the game at an earlier point, which means that the progression of the rest of the game in the late game is going to be more impactful. This is might be the latest unique uh, unit available in the game. Um, I think it actually... I can't think of a later unique unit now. So this might be the latest unique unit in the game. And the problem with that is it doesn't have time to impact the game. The science is going so fast here that it just doesn't matter. So the bonuses are fine. It would be a decent uh, a decent set of bonuses on any sort of combat unit. Stronger strength. It is better, better range and, uh, you know, gains more experience. Those are good bonuses as a whole, but it just comes too late to matter. It's a... It's essentially an irrelevant, like it just doesn't matter one way or the other to get those to get those on online speed in particular. Perhaps in uh, speeds where there's a little bit more playtime to fight in an era, perhaps there'll be a time for the Mustang to really be dominant. Um, yeah, uh, and hypothetically, it's a unique unit. And unique units don't have strategic uh, resource balance uh, considerations. I guess that is something to be to be interested in. Um, whereas the bomber requires aluminum, the P-51 won't. So I guess that is maybe impactful if you don't have aluminum. This will actually give you some ability to have an air defense or uh, fight other airplanes without having to have aluminum yourself. So I guess there's that going for it. That That is not a bad thing. That is a actually quite a good thing with the way the strategic balance works out right now because strategic balance uh, is very, very strange in the base uh, base map. However, in the NQ group, uh, the group, the multiplayer group, there's already a map out that has strategic resource uh, balance guaranteed so that you will have aluminum. Uh, so you will be able to fight other players uh, who have airplanes, even if you don't, e even even if you're not America, you're going to be guaranteed aluminum. So you're going to be guaranteed the ability to build these uh, these units. So I guess in the base game, that might be one of the better parts of that is the lack of an aluminum requirement. All right, uh, let's talk about the last part of the American bonuses. This is the film studio. Uh, this is a unique uh, building. It replaces the broadcast tower 
for uh, America. Broadcast Tower is available at flight. If I can go click on it, or not flight, excuse me, radio, right after flight. Uh, this is the film studio. Um, it's four culture, one citizen slot, one great artist point, two great musician points, and one great work of music slot. These bonuses are, I believe, identical to the broadcast tower. Let's double check. Yes, they are. Um, so what does the film studio do? This one is going to be almost pure speculation for my part, where a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about I've used, I, I've used sometimes extensively, or I have a pretty good feel for in terms of testing. I've never used a film studio, and I'm not sure. The wording on this is a little bit bizarre. It says, a building unique to America, plus 100% tourism pressure from this city towards other civilizations in the modern era. And this is the part that throws me through a loop. Everything about this, we, we don't actually know exactly how tourism works right now. Um, my best of my knowledge, no one knows that exactly. Perhaps it's been cracked on the forums in between uh, recording this and posting this, or perhaps it's just been done and I'm not noticed. Uh, but I don't think so. I think at the moment, uh, we have a sense of where tourism comes. We know the rough, while well, you want more tourism pressure, uh, people with higher culture are going to be a little bit harder to deal with uh, with tourism. But we don't really know exactly the numbers that pl uh, plug into this. So we don't know quite how much 100% tourism pressure is in terms of impact. You know, clearly it's 100% bonus, so it's double what the city was doing. So that's a good thing. Uh, certainly a high tourism city is going to uh, benefit more from this because your absolute tourism, your total tourism will go up more in a city that gets a double in bonus that has more base tourism. Okay, we're all familiar with that. But the part that throws me through a loop is in the modern era. Does this mean that when I'm in the modern era, this, this uh, city does double tourism? Or does this mean that when my opponents are in the modern era, they take double tourism? Or does it mean that once that modern era and beyond is double pressure? Because all of that's really impactful. I've been talking about the compression of technology in the late game. Basically, your science is so good in the late game. Uh, if you've expanded to like eight or 10 cities, which is pretty standard, like eight cities is pretty damn standard right now uh, for the multiplayer games we're seeing at least eight cities. Um, and by the time your late game comes around, you can you can make pretty easily four to five hundred science per turn. And if you're making five hundred science per turn, that just demolishes these techs. That's two and three turn techs for pretty much everything. And I have now completed a game where uh, my late game science was so good that I have completed the tech tree long before I was able to kill my opponents just because the, the time it took my units to travel around on the map was so long because it's such a lot of space on the map that my tech was so powerful compared to that, that I just completed all the techs on the map and it made no difference whatsoever. So if those bonuses are only applying in the modern era and don't apply past the modern era, you're gonna tech past that bonus basically by the time you built friggin' film, uh, film studios. So I'm a little concerned about what this means when it says, towards other civilizations in the modern era. The re my, my take on this, when I read this, when I parse that sentence myself, it makes it sound like that this building only impacts my opponents in terms of tourism, tourism when my opponents are in the modern era, which probably means that this the, the actual impact, if that's how it works, and this is speculation, if it does work or doesn't work this way, because I'm not entirely sure, I've not been on the receiving end of tourism pressure that I've seen be doubled from a film studio. But if it does work that way, that window and time is going to be a super small number of turns. And that is a little bit uh, disturbing um, because it probably means it's going to have almost no impact whatsoever on a on a uh, strategy that already is a very, very rare conditional strategy, that being a tourism win. So perhaps your uh, your miles will vary a little bit more on a slower speed if you're playing on marathon, marathon or something like that. We're in the modern era, a much longer period of time. This may be more impactful of a bonus. Same kind of thing with the... Uh, the unique unit air unit here but all of these late game units and late game buildings are going to suffer similar problems and this one is particularly exasperated by the fact that uh this only applies during the modern era so it doesn't even get the modern era and beyond if i'm reading that correctly it just gets the modern era which is since you get this halfway through the modern era already it's going to be like five turns where it's useful so i mean i guess in the sense that it is a unique building how's the base cost uh 525 what's the broadcast tower no no base cost reduction so it's not going to build any faster it's not going to be easier to get it does do everything the broadcast tower does so it's not going to be useless it's still going to provide you great work in musician slots and great musician points but it's going to be hard to see this be particularly powerful if it is limited uh in the way that i fear that it is limited so taken as a whole what do we think of teddy um this initial bonus plus five combat strength, it is an early bonus. It's going to help you versus barbs in the early game. It's going to help you defend your cities in the early game. It might be useful depending on how your continent layout comes down. It's okay. 
Um, the rest of the bonuses feel pretty weak to me. The Rough Rider was fun, but seemed probably worse than just regular cavalry as a whole, uh, just because of the way that I'm going to create them. I suppose if it's a long war that drags out in that era, I would of course build these instead of cavalry in that period. Uh, but likely the way I'm going to get cav anyways, I'm going to upgrade horsemen into cav to just save myself tons and tons and tons of hammers. So uh, I didn't think all that much of it. So as a whole, this, this compilation of bonuses kind of weak. I'm you know, we're going to do at some point, uh, not at some point, by the end of this week, when the week that you're watching this, by the, by the time all of the uh, sieves, we've talked about each of the sieves, we're going to do a guide video talking about how I rank the sieves compared to each other as a whole. I think that Teddy is going to end up as one of the uh, mid to weak sieves uh, from that tier list. Anyways, guys, um, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you got to uh, think about this. Uh, have you get your brains poked a little bit of thinking about what these bonuses actually mean in the context of playing against uh, other players and other computer and uh, computer opponents. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please hit the subscribe button. Come check me out on Twitch and come follow me there. And uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching. Filthy out.